we are recording, so go ahead and just give it a clap when you're about to start. That way I know where to flip it, so. Okay. That was a, that was a weak ass clap, wasn't it? There we go, unison. Yeah, I'm Mike and uh, Mike LaRose, and this is um, my first podcast. I'm a little nervous and uh, kind of excited at the same time, so uh, just bear with me here. We're um, kind of on our maiden voyage here. Uh, you know, I'm not doing this alone. I'd like to thank Chris Ruiz for his work behind the scenes as the uh, technical producer of this podcast. Thanks yeah. for everything you're doing, Chris. And uh, so the motive in kind of starting this whole thing was that um, I thought it'd be nice to interview people who work in treatment and addiction recovery. Um, there's a lot of amazing people out there who have, they're basically given their lives to uh, helping people with addiction. And I thought they'd have some, you know, interesting things to say, stories about their work in the field, um, personal stories, all that kind of stuff. So uh, kind of join me on this voyage and we'll see where we go with it. Uh, so um, sober living homes have become a lot, uh, it's, a, well, it's a growing field, it's a growing aspect of uh, treatment. Um, I guess the, you know, the, uh, the end game of the, uh, not the end game, the, uh, I guess the second stage after treatment, a lot of people are now going to sober homes. So it's a growing industry. So we're gonna talk about that today. Um, and if you're interested in starting your own sober living home, you might wanna to listen to what this guy has to say. Uh, this is Bob Fox and he is operating several uh, sober living homes in Chandler, Arizona. And I would venture to say they are fairly successful. So um, Bob Fox, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I guess I can't really have a conversation today without talking about the coronavirus. So um, how's that affecting <coughs> things over at uh, Clean and Sober Homes? Well, uh, it's well, it's affecting everybody. You know, and it's obviously affecting the people in the house, too. So uh, it's a lot difficult for people to right now to get out. To do things and they're not able really able to go to the meetings uh so that's difficult um so we've been having to find uh come up with solutions to that problem so okay um what are some of those solutions well i'm glad you asked me that question mike <laughs> um well zoom's very popular right now um so video conferencing right. uh, there's um a lot of meetings the the uh, 12 set meeting that a lot of us uh, go to from the houses because it's centrally located. <clears throat> they have a Zoom meeting uh, three or four a day. Um, so they're doing that. Um, we've also asked people in the house to uh, come together in the evenings um, to participate in some type of recovery activity. Everything from recovery movies, games, cook dinner, talk about recovery stuff, do meetings. Some of the houses are having meetings at the house and because the people are sheltering, I don't want to call it sheltering in place, I guess stay at home, whatever they're calling it. They're going, uh, because we're all kind of isolating, we're able to go, to the one house can go to another house. So, um, so there sure. are some meetings, just not, it's not the normal, like go to a meeting anytime I feel like it kind of thing. So how are the, um, you call them clients, residents, what do you both either or? Well, uh, it's client, resident. Okay, um, so um, how are they adapting to that? Any feedback, complaints, anything like that? Oddly enough, there hasn't been a lot of complaints. There's, yeah. uh, for the most part, I mean, people, you know, it's, uh, we've all had to learn how to, it was a sudden drastic change for everybody's behavior. So it was like a drastic, changing it you had your ass to change your behavior like immediately and uh <clears throat> i mean i know that people in recovery have a difficult time with change and i mean i think just people in general have a difficult time with change not all of them but a lot of people do and uh so yeah it's just been um there has been a lot of pushback about it um the people that did have an issue with it they they made other just you know other arrangements and that was fine i mean i understood so um, I, I guess I've just been, I guess I've been a little bit surprised that, that people have been able to adapt as well as they have. I guess I, I figured it'd be a harder, um, I don't even know how to describe it. I just thought there'd be more pushback about it. But I think, I think most people that are informed about what's going on have a general desire to do the right thing. 
and um, you know nobody wants to get sick. So sure. So we're, we're a few weeks into this thing, I guess more than a month now. Um, has the kind of the coming and going as far as like people checking in or checking out as clients has that changed at all during that time? As far as checking in and checking in. Yeah, like are you getting a more less client? Are they less likely to leave right now because of what's going on? You think or uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I think your are your houses full right now or the houses are not at a hundred percent. They're about okay. right now. They're about seventy five percent. So <clears throat> it seems to me that because it kind of comes in waves with people coming and going. Um, I do know that right now, for, it's just in general, to get into sober living, uh, most sober living will choose somebody that's in a residential treatment setting before they'll just take somebody that calls them up that they don't know where the person's been. Um, so it's those people are getting preferred treatment, I would say, that uh, as far as uh, housing. Um, a lot of the sober livings are full or they're close to being full. They're being more selective because the people are being asked to stay home. There's more, um, there's more possibility for stress in the house with everybody. And so if you bring somebody in the house that's unstable, um, where normally it might be, you might be able to work with them. I think in this situation, it might be a bit much for the people in the house. Gotcha. Just the stress gotcha. level. So less, the less change, the better right now, probably, right? Yeah, I would say where, where people would be a little more willing to try and work with somebody that maybe is, is not quite as stable as you know we would want them to be, but they were still willing to do the deal. Mm -hmm. um, where now it's like, I, I really don't want to take the risk of bringing somebody in the house that's not totally stable just because it would be very stressful for everybody. So we've had, uh, you know, people relapse and sober living. I mean, that's, just, that's a fact, yeah. you know, and, uh, it's unfortunate, but it does happen. I, I can't say that there's been more people relapsing. Like I, I figured a real stressful thing like this is usually why people go back and start drinking and drugging. I mean, they get stressed out, they freak out and they, you know, that's the excuse they use, but it hasn't been any more than, I would say Christmas, there was more people relapsing than there is during a pandemic, which is weird to me. It seems very strange. Yeah. <laughs> I guess going to your family is probably more stressful than a pandemic, I guess. Yeah. For some people, right? For some of us. <laughs> Depending just, on your family. Yeah. You know, I guess. You know, <laughs> my family's not so bad, but I, I, I've got right. some, some interesting family. So. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, kind of real quick. The, you're, can you like scoot in just a little bit? Oh, just, scooch in. Yeah, it's like not getting both of you at the same time. So. Or you can pull it. Can you pull it back a little? I, I just did it a little. Okay. I think I'll probably help. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah. Is that better? Uh, yeah, and then Bob, you can like move a little bit to your right. If like this? Yeah, that should be perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. All right. We're we are here. actually six feet apart here, just so everyone knows. <laughs> it doesn't look like that on screen, but. You know. All right, go ahead and give it a clap when you're ready and we'll keep going. Okay. Oh, so, um, well, I'm sure you didn't just wake up one day and decide you want to run a sober living house. So tell us a little bit about how you started in that. Uh, well, that is, um, yeah, honestly, to tell you the God's honest truth, my wife was the one that it was kind of her idea to do one. Okay. She had experience. Uh, both of us had experience living in sober living when we were both getting sober and um, she probably had a better experience than I did with it. I think it's a safe bet to say. And she really, really wanted to do it. So we decided to go ahead and try it. I mean, it's just, we were both into recovery. We we're both active and uh, doing service work and we figured it was a good way to get back to the community. So. Okay, and so you started with one house here in Chandler. Is that how it started? Yep, uh, we started off. And with, what year was that? Uh, 2016, 17. Okay, so pretty recent, actually. A couple oh. years, three years, I think. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 2000. I think it was towards the end of 2016. Okay. It took a while to find the uh, house that we liked. Yeah. So, your house that you like, what? kind of goes into that when you think of a house that you like for sober living? Well, we were, uh, <clears throat> I guess one thing that we wanted to do that both of, that, that we were adamant doing and her, her uh, son 
and his wife, Michael and Joanna, own the uh, business with us. So the th the we all agreed the one thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to uh, offer uh, different, like a higher level of um, housing. Is that, a, is that a good way to put it, a higher level of housing? Oh, as opposed uh, to like uh, some other sober livings that might have been not as nice or not as comfortable? Or... Well, <clears throat> yeah, I think that there was a, some different things that went into it. One was we didn't want to cram people into a house. We weren't going to do bunk beds. I wasn't going to have 15 people living in a two-bedroom house. Mm -hmm. um, none of us wanted that. So we wanted to have it, first of all, comfortable. We wanted to have nicer houses, swimming pool, in a right regular residential, you know, single family home in a in a decent neighborhood, and um, we wanted to treat it like something. If if one of us had to live here, we could do it and be okay with it, you know. Um, and we also wanted to, at the time, we wanted to charge a premium for that. So, for instance, when we started, I think the going rate for sober living was about one hundred thirty five, one hundred fifty dollars. And we came in at right at 175. So that's not a big difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is for somebody that in is this new in recovery, you know, 20 bucks a week is a lot to some, some of us. Sure. Um, but they, it, it's what they were getting for the 20 bucks. They're getting a good program. Mm -hmm. We're actively involved with what goes on. It, we're recovery focused and they had a nice place to live that was safe and clean. Safe so, and clean. Okay. Safe and clean, baby. Yep. There you sober, go. safe, and clean. That's how we do it at Clean Sober Homes, LLC. <laughs> That's kind of your motto. That's it. Sober. sober, safe, and clean. Yeah. Trademark. That's it, um, man. All right. Well, that sounds pretty good. So, um, and now three or four years later, you now have four houses all in Chandler? Yeah, four working on a fifth house. Working on a fifth. Okay. Working so, on a big five. Awesome. Okay. So, um, tell me a little <laughs> bit about the structure, right? Um, you know, as far as like uh, the structure of, uh, I used to have a manager in the house and other roles up, uh, and as far as like what what people are required to do on a daily basis there. So there's each house has a full-time house manager that uh, lives in the house. Some of them work part-time, some of them are full-time at the house. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, a peer support person, which is like an assistant manager type of person. Um, but they're a support person for the house manager. Um, each person is expected to do a daily chore and a weekly chore. Um, the daily chore is uh, like a little five minute sweep the kitchen. That would be a daily chore. Um, weekly chore would be like mow the lawn, clean a bathroom, that kind of thing. Um, all the residents are expected to do at least five meetings a week. Obviously, that has been a challenge with what's going on. So they still have to do five meetings of some sort, not necessarily go to an outside 12-step meeting. But um, everybody is expected to um, be home by 1130 at night. Everybody is expected to be a productive, useful human being in we push recovery and service. I mean, that, those are the things that we really like to see people doing. So what does that look like for a client who, who's succeeding in that, who's into recovery and service? What are they doing? They could be doing anything from <clears throat> chairing, a, chairing a meeting, 12-step meeting. That would be a, a being of service. Mm -hmm. Making coffee, taking out the trash at you know, one of the meeting halls, um, being a greeter at a hall. It could be going to the food bank. It could be doing something for the church. It could be just basically doing something, volunteer work, being of service in our community to give back to the community. Okay. You know, it's not, is everybody 100% successful? No, but those are the, that's kind of the principles that we look, you know, that we're wanting to instill in people that it's important to do that stuff. Right, right. So being in this for a few years, do you ever like look at someone coming in and you're, talking to them and you kind of you already have an idea if you're in your mind if they're going to succeed or not you're like you know what I mean is that you're I mean we're all kind of judge people like when we meet them I'm sure a little bit you know and it's like so you know do you do you find yourself doing that and how often and how are you is that my plan I turned it off it's not... what is what that, is that? 
It's weird because my phone's off, the do not disturb, and the ringer's off. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and it was some number I don't know. So. Sanford and Son is a... Yeah. Nice, nice. A bit, so yeah. you're... Sorry. Can you going to clap cut? again? You're going to cut me out right yeah, there? Yeah, another clap. In there. At a point. Okay. <laughs> clap. Yep. The clapper. I better clap again because I just said something silly, so... <laughs> I'm going to see all these... Oh, shit. All right. So, yeah, when you... Um, you look at a guy coming in, you know, Joe just came out of treatment, you know, and he comes in and talks to you. Do you already have an idea in your mind of, like, this guy's going to be successful in my sober home, or how does that work? To be totally honest with you, I'm just a human being. Mm -hmm. So I, I automatically, um, it, it's just an automatic thing. It's not something I'm proud of or something I like about myself, but I automatically go... Oh, this guy's my horse in the race, man. He's, you know, this this person's going to be the one that makes it. And then other people, I'm like, well, we'll see how they do, right? Yeah. What I can tell you is I have about a, a about a 100% uh, unsuccessful rate of picking winners and losers. <laughs> it's like, that's why I don't try and do it. Because the people, some people that come in just beaten up, oh. and they, they are like rock stars now. And other people that come in and they, have, they talk a good game, and they seem like they're kind of put together. And they, they've totally let me down. So it's, 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 you I don't want know. To, you wouldn't I want to put odds in Vegas on these have, guys, right? I wish I had a magic wand because yeah. then I'd have a 100% success rate in my house, but. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. You know what I mean? So, you know, as these clients come in and go about their, you know, uh, lives, how do you, um, you know, if a client is, you know, fucking up, you know, and, uh, you when do you, when do you, when do you cut them loose? You know, when do you, I mean, how many do they, uh, do you let them back after they relapse? How does that work? That's a great question you're asking. So uh, what I can tell you is that every single person in our house, we treat with respect mm -hmm. and we want to, we want to see them be successful. Recovery is a journey for a lot of people. A lot of people don't get it on the first rodeo. They're not like, you know, um, other people, they're just in and out, in and out, in and out. Now, with all that being said is, my question would be, are they demonstrating a desire to make some changes in their life? Mm -hmm. Because if they're not willing to make some changes, they're not willing to follow directions, they're not willing to try, then then, then it's difficult for us to um, help them. I mean, it just people, people tend to, the ones that seem like they are more successful at recovery have been beaten into a state of reasonableness and they're open-minded to, to doing something different. You know what I mean? So do I kick somebody out when they use? I, 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 we treat every single person as an individual person. So we usually it involves uh, my wife and I and a house manager talking and figuring out is it good to bring them back? Sometimes it's not good to bring them back. Sometimes it's not good for the person, not good for the house, not good for anybody. Sometimes it's, it's absolutely, we should try and bring them back and keep working with them, you know, but at some point, you know, it's, it's not a revolving door kind of thing. You know, we've had people that have, you know, gone out once, twice, and, and then we try and find some other housing for them. And sometimes you do better in another place. Sometimes I don't have all the answers. Yeah. I mean, we have relationships with a lot of different sober livings. We get people from them, they, we send people there. And so it's, I can th think of a very few, times where we've asked somebody to leave and really meant like you got to go and you're out of here right now and we weren't actively trying to find some other housing or help them out right you're not just gonna kick them to the curb and say good yeah. luck oh okay that's well i mean that yeah that's compassionate it, 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 a lot of it just depends on the situation of what happened and somebody's willingness you know um did they did they tell on themselves did they call me on the phone and say hey man I, I, something something happened i made a mistake i mean you know, or is it, I'm trying to give me UA and they're going, oh, I can't pee right now. And, you know, <laughs> three hours later, I still, man, I really can't pee. I must have ate a lot of salt today or, you know. <laughs> right. I, don't, I don't know what yeah. their end game there yeah. is. but And they're nodding yeah. off on the, you know what I mean? It's just, you know, what, at what point is it affecting everybody and is it not healthy? Is okay. it a safety? Sometimes it's a safety thing. Sometimes you got to get them out of here and I get, they got to, they're going from here over to detox or from here to Aurora. Sometimes it's behavioral. There's sometimes people, sometimes we ask people to go get some outside help because it's not even an addiction like a, issue anymore. A it's a mental health issue. Right, right. Yeah. But you do accept clients that are 
have mental health issues and are on medication for if they're uh, stable. If they're stable. If, if I mean, here's the other thing: they could be uh, have all the money in the world, mm -hmm. but if they're totally unstable, that how is that helping? It's going to drive everybody in the house crazy. It's going to drive me crazy. It's going to drive them crazy. Everybody's going crazy, you know. And so we're, we're looking for people that are stable that, that want to make some changes. I mean, those are the people we want to work with. Okay. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. So um, I know there's probably no hard science to this, but um, do you have any, like, rough idea about what the success rate of, like, recovery your recovery homes are as far as like i i don't even know how to kind of quantify the question because do you say well how many people stay sober three months or six months or a year um what or so what is it how long does the average client stay do you have any idea about what that would be i know you know that's a really good question you're asking and it's i have some of that information i just don't have it off the top of my head mm -hmm. um what i can tell you is that one thing that's different about what we do, right, is that we don't have, we have a 90 day commitment that we ask from people. So that's a minimum, but I, we don't have a cap on it. So if somebody wants to live with us for a year, mm -hmm. that's okay. There's a lot of sober livings that like after three months, you gotta go. Yeah. Because they don't want the old dog staying in the house and you know what I mean? Right. So I would say probably we're around 80% right. on people that come in and stay stay sober, you know, whatever happens after they leave. Most of them, I can tell you, most of them are still sober. You know, not all of them, but it's somewhere around 80%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it would take some kind of research or study to figure out exactly, you know, what the relapse rate is and all that kind of stuff. But, um, and I, yeah, so, so I, um, I also want to talk about the uh, ASRA, the Arizona Recovery Housing Association. It seems like they've kind of gotten a little bigger or more important to uh, in, sober, in the sober living world in recent years. Is that true? <clears throat> well, I'm glad you asked me about ASRA, Mike. <laughs> um, the Arizona Recovery Housing Association. So I'm actually on the membership committee for ASRA. Mm -hmm. uh, I volunteered to do that for them they needed some help just um there's a lot of members and there was a lot of um they just need some help it's because it's all volunteers okay. so i think right now currently there's about i want to say there's about 2500 beds mm -hmm. between all the sober living homes that are registered with ezra correct um one of the reasons we joined that's statewide then it's a state yeah okay. it's that's it's actually right. they're they're the um they are the Arizona chapter for NAR, which is National Depth. Okay. Yeah. So one of the reasons we joined originally was that the Arizona state did not have a license for sober living. Hmm. So if you wanted a sober living house, you certainly could run one, but there was no license for the state. So, so what, go ahead. So what did that mean for a sober living then? Was it better or was it easier? Great question. <laughs> It's kind of a it, the wild, depends, wild west of sober living. Huh? It depends where you were located, right. right? So what what all this what came about for Arizona was Prescott. It's like a huge recovery place, right. and what happened was everybody figured that out. And they went up there and bought a bunch of houses and started running sober livings. Right. So there'd be ten of them on one block. People would be clustering houses and doing all kinds of weird stuff up there. And Prescott finally, the people in the town got mad and went down the city hall and they passed a bunch of laws in the city uh, zoning stuff okay <clears throat> that's kind of what started some of this since then um the you'd have to deal with the city if you wanted to get a sober living house uh licensed um but then part of the city uh permit was the, they wanted you to go get a state license within 90 days but there wasn't one. So last year, the state, the governor signed into a law, uh, sober living uh, license for it. And we were, and as was working with the Arizona Department of Health uh, and the Department of Corrections, they were all working together to try and figure out fees, mm -hmm. um, who was gonna certify the houses, what, what rules, all that stuff. So who actually, is there a license now and who issues it? Okay, so how that works is you can be an ASRA member, 
if you were an ASRA member at the time the license became available, you could apply to the state for a license. As long as you're a certified house, you would have to pay the licensing fees, you'd get a license. ASRA is actually the certifying body for the state. So what that means is, is that if you're uh, uh, ASRA basically, if you're an ASRA member and you're a certified house, the state doesn't come out and check it. It's not, they, that's, they're the certifying body. They do the inspections. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So that's what's happening with that right now. Okay. So is it required to be a member of ASRA or is it just a good idea? Well, this is what I know too. Because <laughs> I just found this out. <laughs> is if you don't have a license through the state, I think it was September 30th was a cutoff. If you don't have a license with the state to have a sober house, they have an enforcement division now. Mm -hmm. So if they find out you're running a sober house and you don't have a license, it's a thousand dollars a day fine. Wow. So that's, that's expensive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> or you could join ASRA, get your house certified, and then they'll right. probably, you know, pave your license and you're good. That's the easier, softer way, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Uh, so, yes. Um, what kind of changes have you seen in the sober living industry and, in, you know, in the few years you've been at it, anything significant? I think just in this short time we've been in it, <clears throat> I think that, um, I think a lot of the smaller people that have like one house, maybe two houses, that are kind of off the radar. I think they're like totally off the radar now because they they're not trying to draw attention to themselves. Um, and they've lowered their prices down to some ridiculous amounts. So like you can get it, you know, no licensed house, you know, hey, it's a sort of living house, 120, 130 a week maybe. The what houses are all legit. As members have licenses doing the right stuff. They're all about 100, and now they're up to about 175 a week for mm -hmm. housing. So the, the pricing, I think, but then again, you know, the last couple of years, I mean, the cost of living has gone up, everything's gone up. So, yeah. So like, it's kind of changed though. Cause like maybe in years past, anyone could just open up a sober living, call it a sober yeah. living house yeah. and basically have no structure, no rules. If Correct. They, they just say, yeah, this is a sober living house, hundred bucks a week or yeah. 150, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, good luck to you. Just as long as you pay rent, they're happy. Right. right. I mean, there are places like that yeah. or there were maybe, yeah. maybe it's less so now. I, I think that as a, as a person that owns a sort of that's involved with it, I think what, what bothers me is when I hear people talking about, they confuse halfway houses, group homes, sober living, like they just clump it all together right. and they're not the same thing. Right, right. And another thing is, is, or people that, that are living in sober living. And then I talk to them about living there or what they do. And it's, I couldn't tell you what it is. It's more like a group home kind of situation where they would just pay their, their sleep on a futon in a closet. Mm -hmm. And they're totally okay with that. I mean, and that's okay. I mean, whatever people want to do. But it just, I think it's unfair when we get lumped together with everybody because what people are doing with us is they're actually signed up for a program. So they're, they're getting, yes, they live, they're, they're living in the house. They have a bed to sleep in. But they're signing up for the program that we are offering them. Right, right. right? Yeah, so you have I actually happen to have one of your uh, oh, policy and procedure manuals right that. here. Um, so this is there's quite a lot of documents in this book. I was surprised. Um, and you Thank have you one, Azra. <laughs> this all required. Everything in here is required by Azra. Yes. Or, okay, so um, and you have one of these in each each of your homes. Yes. I take it. Okay, so but yeah, I was kind of looking. Are you going to page twenty? You're going to pull something out and ask me what's on page twenty? No, okay. I don't, what, don't do that, I? please. No, okay. I just. I could uh, tell you what's on page 20. No, I was just looking through it and you have, so you have um, all your kind of legal documents for the house or you have important numbers to call. You have your yeah. uh, resident re rights and responsibilities, code of ethics. Um, there's, a, there's just a bunch of documents, waiver yeah. liability, some yeah. legal stuff in here. Yeah. Good neighbor policy. So a lot of thought went into this, it looks like. Yes. I mean, it, you just didn't like, you know, wing it with this stuff you were actually kind of thinking about everything that went into this yes. it's like yeah so what would you tell someone you know it's like i mean it seems like you got your you you know 
you really know what you're doing here. What would you tell someone who wants to start a sober living? How do they, how do they get all this stuff together? I mean, it seems kind of complex when you. Well, I can tell you that as far as the that book, mm -hmm. that policy and procedure books, Azra was um, very helpful with that. Okay. We had our own, right? We had our own policies and procedures in place. So when we joined Azra and transitioned into their format, mm -hmm. we just kind of brought our stuff into their template. But they kind of, it was more, um, they had worked out some of the, you know, the issues with it when they put the, the manual together. Okay. Um, so what I would say if anybody was interested in sober living, and I, again, I'm not working for Azra, there's nothing in it for me with the Azra part of it, but hmm. if somebody was even interested in opening a sober living house, I would encourage them to come to an Azra meeting. They're on the third Wednesday of every month at the Native Connection uh, down in Phoenix. Okay. Sixth floor, uh, I think it's at eight or nine o'clock. Um, they and can also go to our website and sign up, and yeah, sure. we yeah, put right. on the mailing list. But they could come and, and they can come and ask questions and see, yeah. and see if they want to get involved with it. Right, right. And that's a z r h a dot org. Yeah. I think. Is that right? If they join, if they're if they're interested in joining us, they, there's a hundred fifty dollar application fee. Mm -hmm. Once they do, they once they fill the paperwork out and pay the fee, then we'll assign them a mentor and an inspector for their house. Okay. So they actually have a mentor that helps them put, like we had a mentor help us with this. Okay. Yeah. So Azra sounds pretty helpful in fact. So yes. if you are wanting to start a sober living house, maybe just go uh, contact Azra first off and it'd be a good starting point. Uh, nice. So- uh, I appreciate you bringing that policy as a pretty- Well, you know, I uh, was fortunate enough to, I was able to borrow one for a short time uh, from one of your houses, uh, there's nothing illegal, but, uh, so what's a typical day like for you? Is there, I mean, is there such a typical, typical thing as a day in the life of a sober living house operator? <clears throat> well, I wake up at, well, it depends. If my dogs want to go outside, then I get up at, like, depends, 530 oh. in the morning. Uh, no, I, I don't know. I mean, it's. I, it's kind of like an on-call thing, you know what I mean? So there's, uh, I mean, I have normal stuff, you know, paperwork, emails, or networking with people, um, meetings, you know, um, going and doing uh, lunch and learns and um, touring treatment centers and having the tour of the houses. Um, so that's a big part of what I, I guess I would do. Um, we have a person that helps us with our marketing. And then we um, have another person that helps with some of the maintenance up on the houses. So. It's, it's not, do you get a three o'clock phone call and have to go over and deal with somebody at a house? Yes. Does it happen very often? No. Hmm. Um, but I don't know. It's a lot of recovery stuff. I mean, if you're into recovery, if you're into recovery and want to have a sober house, it's kind of a cool job. Right. Yeah, there's right. worse, there's worse, worse things I could do with my time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you had, um, what was your life like before um, you started the sober living? Did you have other businesses? I was a rock star. A rock star, okay. Yeah. You yeah. didn't know that? No, I thought you looked like that guy from Stone Temple Pilots. I wasn't sure. I, I am, yeah. man. <laughs> okay, so, but, yeah, did, I mean, you had some other... I owned a recording previous... studio in Seattle. You did? Okay. Yeah, I did oh. that for 10 years, I guess, recording audio, music, doing music production. And then, uh, so I, that's what I was doing. And then before that, I was a software engineer. I had gone to college to learn how to do software engineering. Mm -hmm. And then I had a horrible relapse. Uh, well, I got the cocaine in the hotel rooms, but uh, you know, yeah, and then I, I so I went on for a year and a half and I, I, I just destroyed the part of my brain that had to do with like, engineer, uh, software engineer. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. that was like, boom, <laughs> all the college, boom, it's gone. You know, um, yeah. yeah, so I just, you know, it's a comeback kid, man. I just started off, you know, doing some menial work and eventually I got into a management position doing uh, video game stuff. And then um, I, I started doing the music stuff and that was kind of equally, you know, the pay was about the same and I just, you know, kept doing that. I just, I like doing that more, so. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, 
What about, you know, you want to talk a little bit about your personal battles with addiction? When did that start for you? What did it look like? How did it end? My first time in treatment, I was 17 years old. And back in the day, I went to Milam's Recovery Center, which is even called Lakeside Milam. It was up in Seattle. It's a, it was like one of the only resident, I think there was only two or three residential treatments up there. Uh, but that was like the big one. And uh, 17 years old for a cocaine addiction. Um, That's pretty young for showing cocaine. Well, you know, the fact that I was blacking out when I was drinking, huh. that, that just didn't even occur. I thought that's how people drank. <laughs> I just, well, well, fuck, you mean you're not supposed to black out when you get drunk? That's I, a party. I, I, fuck it. I just figured, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, no wonder my parents are so fucking weird when they're drinking. But anyways, yeah. um, so that that's what got me into treatment uh, 17 years old. And back then, there was no adolescent treatment center. Like, they just threw everybody, they just threw your ass in there. And, uh, you know, it was 17 years old, man. I, you know, the first thing I did within the first week is ran off some 16-year-old girl there that, you know what I mean? Ran off, took her, you know, we, we laughed. It was love. AMA, it was true AMA, love. AMA, man. Uh. AMA, and uh, she got kicked <laughs> out. They, and my, I, it, my family had uh, had resources, so I don't know. I don't know who they, who they paid at the treatment center, but they let me come back. Uh-huh. And uh, I finished out there. And then um, I stayed sober for a little while, but... I just wasn't done. So a lot of my 20s and 30s was a lot of maintenance drinking, a lot through my 20s. And then, you know, eventually just, I got right back in the, you know, <laughs> my true love, you know, cocaine. And, you know, it's, it, I swore it off, swore it off, swore it off. And then it was just the right place at the right time with, with the right amount of money. And it's, you know, it was boom, I was off. And so it was uh, in and out of treatment center, you know, in my late 20s trying to do the IOP thing, the PHP thing, the doing all that. And uh, I think I tried sober living a couple times. Still wasn't done. And then I, I had gotten sober and I was able to stay sober for, I don't know, about five years. That's when I went back to college. And then my dad passed away and I had inherited some money. So I figured, well, shit, my problem was I didn't have enough money to do cocaine the way I wanted to do it. <laughs> That's right? the problem, right? So you I had plenty out. of money. And what I could tell you is, you know, I figured I was going to die. I just figured I'm just going out like this. So let's just have fun. Right. You know, let's, let's party like rock stars, literally. And then what happened was the last couple of months when I was running out of money, I was like, shit, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and I was trying to get the job done and it wasn't working. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, just a series of events, you know, that, um, it just literally, I think me running out of money and hitting the bottom that way with just the devastation of it was was what really, you know, there wasn't going to be a treatment center. I didn't get to go to detox. Hmm. I didn't get the, you know. No money, no insurance, nothing no, like that. No, 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 no relatives no, willing no. To, to pay for I the, pay the, the couch, bill. baby. Three yeah. or four days, you know, getting off benzos, getting off the, the cocaine is whatever, you know. So you just cleaned up on your detox on your own that last time? Yeah, yeah, and I think I waited about a week, and then I went to a I went to a twelve step meeting. Mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure that I was done before I got it. You know, the one thing I hated was when I went to meetings and people were like, "Oh, I'm done," you know. And then it, you know, two days later, I use and they come back, "Oh, I'm done." And then I go, you know, I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. I just wanted if I was done, I was going to be done. Like, yeah, I either do it or I don't. So I wanted to make sure that I was like done, and could kid could show up to the meeting and mean it, you know. And I just did. I hung out with all the new people and did the new person thing for, I didn't get a sponsor. I didn't work the steps. I just went to meetings, went to the dances. They were, they were great. Tried to get a couple of AA girlfriends. Right. You know, so you got is, involved. You know, that is right, Mike? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> heard nothing. Heard, I've heard about it. Yeah, I've heard the boy and girl meets on AA campus, something like that. Yeah, is that how it goes? Boy falls in love. Yeah. Um, so so you got into the group. You got it into a recovery program yep. and I've never looked back basically since then. Right? Yeah. Awesome? I mean, I was, I was, I was quite sober when I, when I got, a, when I got a sponsor and worked my steps, like my life depended on it. I was like right. ready to commit suicide sober. Like I did not like being sober. Yeah. And the, and the thing that I, I, I just don't like being sober. I didn't understand it. It's like, well, I don't like, I don't like white knuckling it. That's the word. I don't sure. like abstinence. So what do you say to, you know, guys and, and girls who you see who, who feel that same way that you did, you know, when they're, when you're living in one of your homes now, no, oh, those meetings are boring or, you know, what do I do? I don't know what to do with myself or, 
I, you know, maybe they feel like they were happier when they were getting high or drinking. Well, yeah, I understand that. I mean, look, if I could go do cocaine on a Friday night mm -hmm. successfully, I'd be doing it right now. The problem is I don't like the consequences that come with all that. <clears throat> so what happened was the consequences I had to get bad enough where I just didn't want the consequences anymore. Right? You with me on that? I, so the I'm new people that are like, well, they don't like going to meetings. Well, okay. I don't, I don't like going to meetings either. A lot of times I don't, you know, I mean, you know, I know, I know a lot of people's stories better than they know them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But what are you going to do? Um, yeah, I could do this all night, Mike. <laughs> well, um, you're in luck because, uh, yeah, we got all night, uh, so I don't know if uh, Christine would be willing to hang out all night, but uh, so and talk about Christine for a minute. She's been involved you, uh, with you in this. Um, how does that work for you too? Like, do you have like a kind of division of duties of who handles what, or you know, how does that go? My wife's the CEO. Okay, as it should be. Yes, my wife is is my wife. Whatever my wife's will is, that'll be what happens. So she has a final say over uh, things. You know, I, it's not like a dictatorship, but she really does kind of have the final say over things. But she, I do a lot of the. Um, well, I'm sure you're not stuff. running through with every decision you make every no. day, but no. as far as when you say over things, like, uh, what does that mean? I'm a little more specific. Well, she also has a background in chemical dependency. She was a licensed okay. counselor. Okay. So a lot of stuff that a lot of stuff that she, I go to her to ask for help with, or behavioral things, or issues with uh, uh, tenants. Um, a lot of it's just pro the program part of it stuff is, is I go to her for advice for that stuff or have her help. Um, but she also handles the, um, she deals with the finances. Okay. So God, my thing is like, I want to deal with the people and deal with the houses and deal with the stuff and let her handle that piece. That way, if there's an issue with it, they can deal with her directly. Mm -hmm. It's not me, you know, like sometimes if there's a, we got to ask somebody to leave the house cause we got no refund policy. Um, I don't handle the money. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, so, doesn't that seem to be working pretty well for you? Do you guys, you know, have conflict or uh, Never. disagreements much? Never. Never? My wife and I? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, look, we're married. Yeah. We have disagreements. Um, but at the end of the day, we, um, at the end of the day, we work through what we got to work through to get things done. Nice, nice. So, and you've both been in recovery some years now, so I guess, I mean, do you think, you know, running the Sober Living's home is is that, I'm sure it kind of boosts your own recovery in a way, too, in a lot of ways, maybe, right? Some. Some. <laughs> I mean, well, the pro here's, here's, it, it's, it's a catch-22. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's cool that my wife and I share recovery and get to do this, but at the same time, it's like when we go, when, when I, it's not like a, punch out at work and go home <laughs> so what happens is, is I go home and then the phone rings and there's something and we got to talk about it and we're doing recovery then we go over to the house and so it's like it's pretty much all the time you know and that's fine I mean we're cool with it right. but it, there's never really it's very difficult to take get a break do you ever take a vacation do you uh, guys we, take yes. a couple of weeks and go to I don't know San well, Diego, her, Mexico or something yeah her kids are in California so we go to San Diego oh her grandkids are there. We get to go to San Diego and hang out with the grandkids. Um, it's just a time to do it. So some, that can be challenging. And right now we're not going anywhere because nobody's going anywhere. So. Right, yeah. So <laughs> for that. Right. So who, like if you were to go away for two weeks, do you have who kind of runs things while you're gone? Just the managers kind of take care of the houses? And then... There's uh, the, the marketing person. Would probably be, uh, it, you know, he was also a resident and also a house manager, and so and he's, in, you know, he's pretty much involved with all aspects of what goes on. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's very capable of, of taking care of stuff. I mean, he could still call us, and you know, and if there was some major, major something major, I mean, we're only six hours in a car away from getting back here, so. But it's never, we've been able to go and not have to come back. Yeah. 
any uh when you think about like I don't want to say disaster but like you know kind of things that have happened over the years that have uh <laughs> kind of scared you or been really dramatic maybe uh I don't know client OD in the house or something Does that kind of stuff happen or We've been very fortunate we haven't anybody OD in our house. And that is something my wife and I are very, very um, uh, grateful that that has never happened. I mean, I've been told it's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Hmm. That something like that will happen. Knowing that, <clears throat> knowing the, um, the world now, the world's different than when it was when I got sober. Fentanyl's huge, opiates, all that. It's scary. Yeah, for sure. And I think what's scary about fentanyl is, is that it's in everything. It's like you know, some people don't even know they yeah, they lease, yeah. they yeah. lease it because it's so um, cheap, super fast it. acting. Yeah. It's and they don't know what they're buying. They don't know what they're getting. So somebody might be thinking, "Hey, I'm just gonna take the edge off something." And next thing, they're nodding off on the couch, right? So. And what's scary about it is it's just, um, um, it's just a very powerful drug. It's just, uh, it is what it is. So, um, the most scariest thing that's ever happened is we had somebody that was supposed to move in to one of the houses and he was a young kid, good looking kid, 23, 24 years old. And he was coming out of treatment and he left. He dropped his stuff off at the house and he was going to go to his parents to visit the cousin was in town or the, there was something. He was going to go see his family, which is fine. And then, um, but he decided he didn't come back. He didn't come back. He didn't come back. And then um, I think if I remember right, the, somebody called in the morning to say, hey, this person didn't come back. And we were trying to reach out. We were trying to call the person. And the next thing I know, the police department, the detective was calling me from the police department saying that there was a missing person's report for him. And it just it, it went downhill from there. But the point of it is, is that they actually, the, the, the person OD'd and died. Not, not at our house, it was somewhere else. But there was a couple days there where we didn't know what happened, where he was. The police said he was missing somebody else said he was not he was deceased and the police didn't know he was deceased i mean it was like really weird did you have to notify family or did they find out some it, it just or? it got so weird because we were trying to help we wanted to help we had video of him leaving not coming back at one point they, the detective thought he had came back to the house and i'm like no there's a video of him leaving he never comes back and i, I offered to you know share the video with the place it's over there you can go pick it up see it whatever and um, the, the person that said he had came back to the house was the person where he passed away at. Like there was a, a group of them that were partying and doing whatever. And they were trying to cover for him passing. It was weird. I don't, and to this day, I still don't know what happened. I don't know if anybody got in trouble. I, hmm. I don't know. Hmm. But it was just, it just reminded me of how like it, it could just happen. It's just, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we, we, I mean, we have Narcan in the house. Every house has Narcan in it. Somebody's been trained in the house, knows how to use it. Um, and that's, you know, we're just aware of it. It's scary. I hoard, uh, yeah, fentanyl's a horrible drug. Horrible drug. Horrible drug. I feel, bad. I feel bad for the uh, people that are having to deal with that. Right. And well, with all the news of the coronavirus, we're not really paying attention to opiate overdoses which had been a pretty big story yeah, the last year right <laughs> yeah is there a presidential race going on right now yeah uh, i don't know yeah <laughs> i think trump's gonna be president forever now at least that's the way he's gonna you know Could be. try to so um uh, yeah it's strange times um uh, well i uh i do appreciate you coming on the show and you know uh talking to us about sober living um uh, where do you see yourself in, you know, do you have a grand plan for the future or are you kind of just take, take it over the world, dude? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First Chandler, then the world, uh, cleaning sober homes, uh, like the McDonald's of sober homes throughout the country. I mean, do you have a, what's your, where do you see yourself in five years with the company? 
in five years from now? Sure. Probably. Five years. Hopefully, I'm going to be retired in five years. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't think I'll be retired. Maybe. Uh, no, I think that we're we're looking at. I know that we're looking at uh, getting another home, hmm. and I would think there's um, at that point. I think we're just uh, we'd be looking at possibly doing uh, getting a commercial piece of property and maybe doing some. You know, in a perfect world, what I'd have, hmm. right? In a perfect world, hmm. I would have a little complex, like of apartments or like a cool hotel that's really kind of like cool. With like a cool clubhouse, right? That we could do PHP IOP or have some kind of like a meeting place right. there. Well, that sounds more like a residential treatment center. Kind yeah. of, but it's like the Clean and Sober Home spin on a treatment center. Okay, but yeah, getting into IOP PHP something like that um, would be cool. Um, but also, I don't know. Yeah, it, we. I mean, it's just something. It would be nice to be able to do something. Okay. In the perfect world. In the perfect world, which, yeah. as we know, it's <laughs> pretty far from perfect lately. But um, yeah. so, but yes, yeah, so you'll see. Still, uh, you know, we're going to get through this thing. Life is going to go on. Uh, people are going to continue to go to treatment and sober home. So yes. that doesn't seem to be like that'll uh, end anytime soon. No. So, uh, well, thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to talk. It. I do have a, a parting gift for you, Bob. Uh, that is a crumble cookie. Now, crumble, if you're listening, I really love your cookies. Uh, so, uh, putting in a little plug for you there. Uh, yeah, they're about the best cookie in the world. Um, so, I would like you to, to have this as a, uh, as a little gift for appearing on the show. And uh, be sure to share it with Christine. because if Man, you... that is a nice looking cookie. It... Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Is that an animal cracker on there? Yeah, it's oh. called Animal Surprise, I think was the oh. name of the cookie. Yeah. So, yeah, be sure to save, share with Christine because, you know, she might she might be a little upset if you kind of just snuck Ooh. off and ate that all your side. <laughs> it's, it's a crack of cookies. Crack uh, of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll find yourself kind of daydreaming about what kind of crumble cookie you want to get next. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've seen the student hat before. But, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I really appreciate Thank you, you coming on the show and, uh, you know, being our first guest. And uh, thanks for all you do for... Uh, you know, for addicts and alcoholics and You're very welcome. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Mm -hmm.